Hey, it's Chris McCord, and today we're going to write a Twitter timeline clone from scratch using Phoenix Live View. My goal is to show you just how great Live View is at building interactive applications. We're not going to have to write any JavaScript to make it happen, and the amount of data that we write on the wire at the end is going to be more efficient than the best single page app you could write by hand. Uh, if that sounds crazy or you're skeptical, stick with me. It's going to go fast, but I promise at the end that I think I'll have you convinced. Okay, so to get started, we can run the mix phoenix new command. So we'll say mix phoenix new chirp, and we can pass dash dash live to get the live view dependencies. And we'll say yes to install our dependencies. Okay, let's see it into that directory and open a new editor. All right, to get started, Phoenix includes a phxgen.live command, and this bootstraps a CRUD live view, which lets us just hit the ground running. So to build our Twitter timeline feature, let's build a timeline, and the resource that we want it to persist is a post, and the plural form of that's gonna be the database table, so we'll call it posts. The field should be, let's say, post should have a username, a body, and let's say a couple of integer fields, like a likes count and a repost count. And this generated a handful of files, a couple of live views, a couple of templates, a migration file, and so on. And it told us we need to copy these live routes to our router. So we'll go ahead and do that to make these web reachable. We'll go into our router. And in our browser pipeline to service browser requests, we'll paste that in. And we'll see how these work in a moment. But with those live routes in place, we can go ahead and run our server with mixphoenix.server and see what this looks like. So we'll visit localhost 4000 slash posts. And uh, whoops, it <laughs> looks like we forgot to create our database, but Phoenix has our back, so we'll say, yes, please create that for me. <laughs> and it uh, looks like we also forgot to run our migrations, but we'll say, yes, please do that. Okay, cool, so we're ready to go here. So we have our tabular list of posts. It's not showing anything yet because we don't have any posts. So if we click on new post, we can see a modal here with the form fields we passed the command line. Uh, but right away, we know we have to do a little bit of work here. We need to add validations for body. That needs to be a text area. And likes count and repost count aren't even user editable. So let's go ahead and add some validations here to get started. So if we go into our form HTML template, and that's in the live uh, post live uh, form uh, component template, this is where we're rendering that form. And we know right away that most of these are not user editable fields. So we'll go ahead and just remove them. And we can say the text input for the body is going to be a text area. So we'll save that, go back. And okay, this is looking more like a Twitter modal. So now if we go back to our application, we need to write some validations. And we can do that in the timeline post module that was generated. So underneath the timeline uh, directory, we can go into post. And here we can see Elixir's Ecto database library, how it's mapping the database table to an Elixir data structure. So we know right away that the likes count and the repost count should default to zero. And the username, we don't have any users, so we'll just say everyone is my username for now. And then we can see Ecto's change set abstraction, which is a way to build up a data structure to track changes that we want to apply to the database. And as far as fields that are allowed to be cast as user input, we know we can only allow the body to be cast. And in fact, we have to require the body to be cast so we can create a post without a body. And here we can also add our own validations to this data structure. Like I want to validate the length of the body. And let's say the minimum amount is going to be two characters and the maximum amount is going to be 250 characters to, to mirror Twitter. So if I save that and refresh here, let's see what happens when I start typing. And immediately I'm getting validations. If I leave it blank, it says it can't be blank. So what's happening here? So we're not shipping anything down to the client, converting any rules to JavaScript. What's happening is Phoenix LiveView establishes a WebSocket connection over this page. And like many client-side frameworks that you're used to, like React, anytime our state changes on our view or our component, our template is going to be re-rendered and the browser DOM is going to be patched. It's just in our case, we're running this paradigm on the server and sending those minimal DOM patches over the wire. So it's incredibly efficient and it just works over WebSockets, effectively giving us client-side validations. So here I can say, okay, I'm gonna make a new post, click save. And we can see instantaneously this shows up. And that was so fast because we also have live navigation. We use browser push state over that WebSocket connection. So if I click new post, it goes to post new. And it's doing that over WebSocket so we don't have to do the whole HTTP handshake over and over and reload everything over HTTP. So we have live navigation happening. We've got real-time events. But our interface leaves a lot to be desired here. So instead of this tabular list of data, let's enhance this to be a little bit more proud about our social timeline here. 
So we can do that in the uh, index template. So if we go into chirp web post live uh, index HTML, we can see this is where we're listing our posts and let's update this to say timeline. We have our logic for showing the modal or not. And here we have our tabular list and we're just doing a for comprehension saying for post and posts in this template, render a table row. So let's make this a little bit fancier. We're not gonna write any new features, but we're gonna rewrite this markup. So let's re delete this table and replace it with a grid, flex grid layout to make it a little bit more uh, modern. So we're still going to go through our posts and instead of rendering all that markup in line, let's use a live component that Phoenix uh, provides to compartmentalize what it means to render a post. So live component takes our socket and we'll call this component uh, chirpweb.postlive.postcomponent. Pass in the ID as the post ID and we'll pass each post along as the state for this component. And if we save this, live reload should kick in and we can see that it, it blows up because it says post component is not available. So we need to define that. So we'll go ahead in the post live directory and create a new post component file. And here's where I can say def module post component. And I can use a chirp web live component to pull in all the code to render a live component. And here's where I could co-locate a template like the index live view and the index HTML, but live view also allows me to render, uh, define a render function directly, and then I can embed, mar embed markup directly next to my code. And this is nice for smaller templates. So here's where I can paste in some markup, which is just gonna be a dressed up version of that code that we deleted. Okay, so I pasted this in here and it's just a, no new features. We just are going through rendering the likes count, rendering the body and the username with a gr grid uh, row and column just to make this a little prettier. So if we save that and go back, we can see, okay, this is looking much more like a social timeline. So this is looking really nice, but now we have another problem because we have a social timeline and social timelines need to be real time. Because if I load two browsers side by side, if I post something on the right, it should show up and it doesn't. So let's make this a real time and see how easy Phoenix allows us to do this over Phoenix PubSub. And it's just gonna take a few lines of code to make it happen. So what we can do is we can go into our timeline and this is the CRUD module that Phoenix generated to get started. And we can see we've got some like list post functions to get all the posts. We can get an individual post. And then we have a couple functions like create and update posts to write to the database. So here's where we can say, okay, all we need to do is broadcast to the world that a post is created or updated. So let's write a function and pipe the result of this database right into a broadcast function that we'll write. So let's say broadcast and we can broadcast an event. Let's call it uh, post created. And likewise for update, we'll broadcast post updated. And then all we need to do is define that function. So I'll say, okay, we need to broadcast these events, but we need to handle the database right failing because it could fail for any reason. The database uh, could be down, po the post could be invalid. And then we want to return that error to the caller. So we'll just maintain that caller contract. And likewise uh, for the success case, we can pattern match on okay post which means the database write occurred. And then we can return the okay post to the caller so we can maintain that contract. Before we do that, we can broadcast over Phoenix PubSub. So we can say Phoenix PubSub dot broadcast, chirp dot PubSub is our PubSub server. And we can say the topic is going to be some global post timeline topic and the event is going to be the event and our post created or updated. And that's it for broadcast. So then all we need to do is allow users to subscribe to our events that we're broadcasting. So we can define a function, let's call it subscribe. And here is where I can call Phoenix PubSub subscribe onto my PubSub server, and we'll subscribe to that same post topic. And that's it, handful of lines of code for subscribe and broadcast. And then to pick these up, I can then go into my live view and subscribe to the events. So I'll go into the index.ex file, and this is rendering my list of posts. And here we can see a mount callback. This is what gets called for live views when they're mounted on the page to be rendered. So before we fetch the posts and assign some template state, let's say if we're connected over a WebSocket. So if this socket has an established connection, then we just call that function we wrote, timeline.subscribe. So now we'll receive those events and we just have to handle them in another callback. So Elixir messages arrive in a, another callback called handle info. So we know that since we're subscribed, we'll receive a handle info callback. And we expect to receive, let's say post created along with the post. And we always get our socket state as our last argument for this live view. 
And all we needed to do, similar to React or other uh, client-side libraries, is update our state. If our state changes, our template gets re-rendered and the browser's gonna update. So we'll do the same thing. We'll say, okay, update our socket state. Let's update the posts. And we can take the existing posts and we'll pre-pin the new post onto that list of posts. And if the model works and we receive these broadcasts and we change our state, then the browser should just update. So if we go back to our browser, let's refresh. Let's post something new. So I can say, hello from the right. And we can see instantaneously, this shows up on the left-hand side. And that just worked. And it's gonna work over any load balance cluster because Phoenix PubSub is distributed and it doesn't require any extra dependencies. So this is off to a great start, but we can already see that our ordering is incorrect. And in fact, if I refresh this page, then the post order flips. So let's fix that. We go back here, we can see that on mount, we're calling this fetch post function, which ultimately just calls timeline list posts. So let's hop into that function and, and rewrite it. So we can see that by default, Phoenix is just saying return all posts in no particular order. So let's write an ecto query to say from P and post. So from all the uh, posts, let's order by uh, descending post ID. And this is the ecto query DSL. This is gonna prevent SQL injection and all that nice jazz. So we go back to the app. We're in our correct order. You can post a new post, say another, and it shows up just like that. So, okay, this is looking really good, but we forgot to implement the edit feature because we know we we're receiving edits coming over the wire as well for updates. So let's go ahead and make sure that we can receive a, a post update. And we can go back to our index, and it's gonna be very similar to our handle info cause. If you remember, we're broadcasting the post updated event as well. So we can say, okay, when a post is updated, I could go through my posts here and find the post with that ID and rewrite the list, but we can apply an optimization in this case because there's no reason for us to hold all these posts in memory on the server, re-render them all just to change one. So Phoenix has a collection optimization which allows us to say, okay, some of these uh, temporary, some of these assigns are gonna be temporary. I don't, I don't need to hold on to them or track them after I'm done rendering. So we can just say, okay, the post assign, anytime it's dealt with is gonna be tracked and then we throw it away and reset it to an empty list after we render. And then the only other side of this is to go back to our index template for this live view and annotate the DOM container to say PHX update equals prepend. So then when we patch the DOM on any update, instead of replacing all the children, we'll only prepend new children. And this allows us to efficiently handle the collection on the server, over the wire, and on the client. So if we save that and go back to the browser, let's go ahead and edit hello from the right and see what happens on the left-hand side. So we'll make it say hello from the right, updated and instantly on the left it just updates and the really cool thing here is if we look at the data on the wire to make this happen it's incredibly tiny so if we can do that by enabling uh, live socket uh, debug on the client and this just uh, enables uh, debug information and let's re-update that row to say let's let's see uh, how much data hit save and we can see the diff that went across the wire here. So the amount of data that we wrote on the wire in its entirety ends up being a almost keyless payload with just an integer one, integer two, and literally the value that we can surgically stitch into the DOM here. So this just fell out of the programming model, right? We, we, we didn't send down the username. We didn't send down the end, the count. We sent down nothing other than a tiny component update and the browser had all the information it needed to stitch that together in the DOM. And this just comes out of the programming model. No more JSON serializers, no more esoteric encoding formats. You just get this for free. Okay, so this is looking super good, but we need to implement retweets and likes to close our feature set out. And we can see how easy it is to manage interactions. So if we go to our post component, we can have client server interaction uh, annotated in our markup. So what we want is when we click on a likes count or a repost count, we want to send an event to the server. So here I can just write some markup and instead of linking somewhere, I can annotate with PHX click that I want this to send a like event to the server. And I want to target this to myself because since it, since this is being rendered inside a live view, we also can send events to our parents. So we want to say target this component itself. And then I want to do the same thing for reposts except instead of sending the like event on click, I want to send the repost event on click. And then I just need to handle that in a callback. So we handle client events in a callback called handle event. So I'll say def handle event. I expect to see, receive like without a payload. And I get my socket as the component state as the last argument. 
And here, instead of changing my component state, I know that the system is going to broadcast these updates, which gets picked up by my parent, which re-renders the component template. So I can just say no reply, return my state unchanged, but then I want to call into the system to perform some side effects. So let's say we're going to write a function with chirp.timeline, and we'll call it, let's say, increment likes, and we can pull the post out of our socket state. So I can say socket assigns.post, and it's going to be the same story for handling the uh, repost. So I'll just say handle the repost event, and we'll call it ink repost. We can save that. So we need to jump into the timeline and write that function. So we'll go back to our timeline. Let's write that uh, ink likes function. And we can pattern match on the post, grab the ID out. And here we want to per perform an atomic database write because if we go through the normal update process, we could have race conditions. So our goal is to write an atomic operation that will not have any race conditions. So we'll say from P in post where ID where p.id is going to be equal to the ID passed in. And we want to return the post that we that we write against. And then I can pipe this to repo update all, which is going to perform that atomic update. And I can tell it to increment the integer field likes count by one. And this is going to return how many records were affected for this update, which will be one. And we can pluck our post out of the list of results. And then I have an updated post and what can I do? I can broadcast to the world that it was updated. So I can call that broadcast function we wrote and call it pass in okay post. And the event will be post updated like before. And that should be it for our atomic up right. And then it's the same story for reposts, except our field is going to change from likes to reposts. So we can just say reposts, save that. Let's refresh. And if the model works, let's click this. And we crash. So what did we do wrong? We'll check the logs. We can see I misspelled the key. I, I said a sings. So let's go fix that. Wonder how many of you saw that. Call it a signs. And we'll click retweet. It works. Did you catch that? Let's try likes. There it goes. And this is just happening. No extra restful route, no routes to define, no controllers, no serializers. And the payload that we put on the wire was even more impressive than before. So let's check this out. We check out the data that we wrote on the wire to update this retweet count. It was an integer key, two, six, and the value three literally to surgically stitch in. No keys on the payload. We didn't have to send the username, the body, anything. So I hope this convinces you that this is an incredibly compelling option to write highly interactive, highly efficient applications without having to write JavaScript. Thanks a lot.